Hey guys, it's Spade, half of me and Carvey, and just want to let you know at the end of this episode, after the credits, we are going to answer some of the questions we asked you to ask us. So if you stick around, you're going to hear them. And if you want to ask us a question, you go to fly on the wall at cadence13.com. That's an email address, people. Get with the program. You can email us at fly on the wall at cadence 13 Dot com. Ask anything to Dana and ask me like really good ones. All right. So get your questions, listen to the questions and ask your questions. Now here's the show. Hey, Jill, I'll be there in a second. I get to talk to my friend here. That's a little bird. Number one, it's a tiny bird. Come on. Ah. Don't, don't scare me. You can't. You can't. Ah. I'm young. I'm strong. Come on, here's the deal. You're a little bird. You're a little bird. Jill, I'll be there in a second. Come on. Oh, he flew off. What should I do with Putin? Oh, he flew away. Okay. <laughs> that was him. All right, there you go. That one, and how and about this? scene. No, here's this for, for Sarah. Uh, okay. I went to the, uh, Sarah sometimes does, you know, dirtier stuff. She's hysterical, by the way. Sarah Silva, we're old friends from SNL, was when I first met her. So, here's one. So, I went to the doctor to get my physical and he goes uh, you know at the end it's sort of in the air that he's gonna go up your behind <laughs> you know what i mean like at a, at a yearly physical they're, they're going up your butt so right i asked mm. the guy to do it when he first walks in can we get that out of the way he goes no i like to save it and i go really i <laughs> mean save it he goes give me something to look forward to this guy this guy as soon as that is done and i don't like gross humor he takes the the glove off he starts walking away throws in the trash can and then sprints out of the office like as if it's some weird what exit. if he goes i just want to get this over with so he goes let's just do it right now and he doesn't even, I, I, i'm not even putting the glove on let's just do this and you're like well wait, wait a second wait a second all right well these Put are the, the worst on. jokes in the world no, but these this, aren't this, this is no, a, but this, this one always made me laugh the last thing you want to hear during that type of exam yeah. look ma no hands <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah i'm sorry it's just because his wieners <laughs> in there greg is finally greg laughing not just like don't just laugh at Shit. Greg is having gyrations. Our producer, Greg Holtzman, at gregholtzman.com. Heather, you laugh at my stuff. He'll laugh at Dana's. <laughs> well, so, uh, look, Mon, no hands. I'm sorry. So it's, oh, Here's mine. This okay. is actually a true Go story. No, yeah. So he goes, Sarah Silverman. I'm going to start with putting, and then we'll say, here, here Sarah. The, he says, I have to put a finger up your buttocks. And I said, feel free. I know it's part of the drill. So he goes, he goes, he got one in there. And he goes, I go, actually, try one more. And he does two. And then I go, just for fun, try to put your whole hand in there. And he goes, okay, it's in there. And I go, now put the other one. He puts the other one. I go, now clap. And he goes, I can't. I go, tight, right? <laughs> what? <laughs> that was a long way, way to go. A long way to go. <laughs> That's a great one. Tight, right? Well, when I my last exam, the guy tries to make jokes around that. And he goes, did you hear about the guy who had five penises? Mm. His pants fit him like a glove. Anyway, drop him. <laughs> <laughs> I know my guy works in bits. I go just do doctor stuff. Just do doctor. Right, Sarah, I, I don't do proctology. Much. We love Sarah because uh, Sarah. she's a hilarious comic. She I see her out. She always has parties on a roof. We'll talk about that. And um, Sarah Silverman is uh, has a great voice because yes. I do voices. I do like her voice. She has a sort of it's all it's almost like it's a sneakily seductive. Uh, cadence when she does stand up you know how she kind of moves mm -hmm. her shoulders and her arms i want to do jokes i remember of hers to her and see if how close i get them try one. Oh, oh you don't uh, have one no when she goes when she comes out and there's a song on mm -hmm. and she goes this is such a good song she goes this song is so good i remember i got gang raped to this song in an alley yeah and i still love the song that's a testament to how great that is that's what she, I think. <laughs> she did something. I, I won't know the whole Dana thing. Dana stares at me. She's canceled and now we're canceled. Oh, she, oh, we have to ask her because some guy in a porn Shh. was whacking off and when he jizzed, he goes, Sarah Silverman. She's had a lot of stuff about She's porn. got a lot of fans. So we'll talk about that. Sarah Silverman has a great sense of humor. I hung out with her at the 40th at the party, the 40th anniversary yeah. of SNL. And my running gag that night was just checking my phone and saying, you're trending right now. So that was that was my runner back then. It was a while back. That's pretty good, especially back then at the 40th because things were just beginning to trend. It was just full of stars. I have a picture with her from that. Um, all right, well, let's hear what she has to say. Action, Sarah. Hi, 
Hello. 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 Sarah, w- would you? Hi. Hey, I know it wasn't official, but would you be on our podcast? <laughs> sure. Oh, great. Thank you. Come on on. When you want to do it? <laughs> now. <laughs> Is that her? She's a black screen. Where am I? How come you can't see me? Are you baby Jessica in the well? Oh, fuck. Wait, let me put it. I have to put it on uh, video. I spent 10 minutes fluffing my hair around so you'd be impressed, you know? I look so good. <laughs> Thank you. Look at Sarah's. You all, look at Sarah's all down. Uh, why am I so low? I don't know. <laughs> no, it's funny. But I, I find it quite disturbing. <laughs> oh, Sarah. Oh, why, s- is that Sarah a Sarah Silverman board? is on our podcast. Yeah. It's not video, so I'm not going to describe your mansion. Um, Sarah, <laughs> we, we, we were just talking about, just quickly, about Ben Simmons. And I forgot you play you? ball. Ben, ben Simmons. Ben Simmons. Ben Simmons? Ben Simmons is a basketball player, and uh, we were saying that I was going to tell Dana that Sarah's a baller, and you what? used to play at Shanlings. Oh, yes. And I had played a few times, but I think you're better did? than me. And then, yeah. Okay, don't question it. Just say, oh, did you? I just but didn't know you played basketball. <laughs> you guys. I'm a fucking athlete. I know. So you were I, a professional cheerleader. <laughs> for a while. They would okay. throw him up, and then it would catch him, right? Remember in high school? I was the uh, sturdy <laughs> bottom of the down. pyramid. <laughs> yeah. Down I played. To earth. Uh, so, Sarah, walk us through. Uh, let's go through now. Dana and I are so this bad. This is this. your life. No, I've got a lot of questions. No, first, and, let and me answers. ask her. She played basketball and she was good at it. And it was with Shanley and all these comedians. It was kind of fun. Yeah, I haven't played basketball since the pandemic. And I am I. And now I'm like, um, I think I am should be done. Because uh, <laughs> in basketball general? is just not good for you when you're older. I had switched from, I said I can only play inside because of my knees. So I did that for a long time. But then I, now I just, I don't know. I feel like I'm going to really hurt myself. Do your knees know the difference you between control, inside and control outside? the pain. <laughs> yeah, because when you play outside, like on a playground or something, it's, mm-hmm. there's, it's um, you know, it's not, um, it's just pavement. Like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't understand. It's an athletic thing, but. <clears throat> Sarah, I just think you guys are always part of the cool group. Uh, David. You, you guys are part, you're cool celebrities, both of you. I just put it together. Listen, s- Sarah, I have a question. <laughs> I get two in a row, Dana. By All the way, right. we, me and Dana Dave, do not know what David we're doing. David is firm. Guys, I, I love your show, <laughs> and it's so interesting. And now the pressure's on because I feel like, oh God, I don't. But um, but I was talking to I don't know if either of you remember um Jonathan Katz, the great Jonathan Katz. Yes, oh, comedian. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Doctor Katz, professional therapist. Yeah, 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 yeah. of course, hundred yeah. percent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was talking to him yesterday, and um, he was like, "Have you heard the Fly on the Wall podcast with Dana Carvey and David Spade?" And I was like, "I'm going to be on it tomorrow." Oh, jeez! Now I'm feeling the pressure. What is Jonathan hearing that we're not? Because we yeah. usually kind of take a nap after Ooh, this and sort of it's reassess so life. Funny and interesting. Well, you know, Dana, I had some lady in front you. of a. Uh, Jersey Mike's yesterday say she saw it. You know what's funny, or she heard it, but you know what's funny, Sarah, have you ever done this? Someone goes like, uh, hey, weren't you on SNL? And I go, thank you. And, she, and, she, and there was and no compliment. I just get nervous and say thanks. Yeah, and they like, go, I oh. saw you in Bubble. <laughs> yeah. And you go, thanks. And then silence. Yeah. I, saw, I saw you on David Letterman and then nothing. <laughs> That's the most fucked up. I saw you do stand up and then silence. My uh, waiter at this place I eat, he's German and he goes, Hey, there was a there was a picture of me of making Are you talking this- about the IHOP on Holloway? No, I wish. That's where I used to go every single day for two years. Uh, th- this is another one. And they get and the waiter goes, because I was kissing a girl in a pool and I don't know, some took, I took a picture a couple years ago. Ooh. And he goes, Hey, and it was in all these websites because she was marginally attractive and i'm sickening so that's always a story so they go uh this we guy gotta get I, him to a therapist i see I don't it like he's talking about my no, friend david like that no i like <laughs> me so i said uh i could understand it anyway so the joke was he came up and he goes hey little pool party this weekend and i go oh, yeah. and he goes a little fun in the sun huh, huh? a little uh splashing around and i go right and he goes i saw pictures of you and i go yeah i know i know oh, and then he, and is this your german accent 
Yeah, maybe it's not Germany. Okay, so slightly, I, slightly maybe, Germany. Maybe it's the valley. So then he goes, uh, he, he goes, hey, and, and then he goes, but then they showed you getting on the water and you look fat. Why do you want them to have pictures like that? I go, why do I want the paparazzi? Do you fucking get out works? He goes, you look bad. And some of the pictures I was like, well, I can't believe it. And I go, do you not, you are from somewhere else because you think I pick, they take a hundred pictures and they have a jeweler's loop and they find the grossest one and go, this is the one we're going with. Run with it. <laughs> so this is a random fan saying this to you. It's like a friend fan, but he's just, oh, okay. he's very, I think he was half being funny, but he half didn't know that I don't sit with the uh, editorial at Daily Mail and go, I think I look better in this one. And they're like, you know what? Great. If you look better and you like it. The Daily Mail fills so many pages with so much minutia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it is crack cocaine. You you go, you go on that thing and man, the little pictures on the side and that guy's in a bathing suit and they're over there. It's so exciting. There's people in there that I don't even know. And I go, why am I? And they're there every day. And I go, are they paying to be on here? Because there's no reason we should be knowing anything. It's so, you know, I really... It, it's not like I'm Britney Spears or something. You know what I mean? So it's like, I don't know. I, if they're around, I never see them pop up unless I were to like Google myself. Like I was, you know, like, like Sasha Baron Cohen, we were meeting for dinner in New York and he's like, well, if we go here, will there be paparazzi? I go, I don't know. Do you read us weekly? Like, who cares? <laughs> like how is that a part of your life? But, um, yeah, yeah it's not, it's something scandalous. We're just getting some nosh. <laughs> Daily they know Mail's they're getting photographed, ads. right? If you're at a beach in a bikini or you're on a yacht off Italy, you know they got telephotos sure. on you, right? No I one guess, should. I mean, I have friends from New Hampshire. Who are like, do you call them and tell them where you'll be? And I'm like, why would I call them when I'm walking uphill in sweat, <laughs> from, you know, like, walking what? my dog, looking like. 18 zits on my face. I was face. wearing a hat and sunglasses and stuff for a while. I don't know. I was allergic to fame. I think at one point my wife said, I don't think anyone's paying attention. <laughs> so I was like, okay, <laughs> it I is got true. it. It and is nor, true. Nor should they. But yeah. Your but there are, the dirty secret, Dana, is that there are probably 50% of that is called in now. That's what I heard. So like, that's yeah. totally crazy to me. Who would, and, and you it, know, like. But, it yeah. makes sense, kind of, because it's places that you never see paparazzi. There's a couple places you kind of know. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, they're coming out of the Rite Aid in, uh, you know, Topanga. And it's like, we got them. And I'm like, so you had to call someone, have them drive out there, get them. And then either they split the money if they're a bigger star. But if they're not a big star, they just hope they sell it somewhere. They just hope they get it out there. Well, I remember one time I picked my mom up years ago at the airport. She was coming to visit. And, you know, I was just... And you know, at the airport, you just get like sloppy thirds or what, like there's a paparazzi <laughs> there for someone big and then they just sloppy. see, and then the airlines, you know, like, so I pick up my mom and there's, and there's like TMZ or paparazzi just walking the whole way to the car. And I'm just, you know, uh, you know, you're, it's like stuff with your mom when you're a daughter, it's, there's so much, you know, and she's just loving it and talking yeah. to them and stopping mm -hmm. and talking to them. <laughs> And I'm like, mom, let's, you know, and if I, if I, you know, you can't like be upset in front of someone. Like, well, let's just get in the car, you know, you know. And she's driving me insane for because she loves it so much. And we get in the car, and and she goes, well, I don't know why you're in such a rush. I mean, they're just doing their job. I said, mom, the greatest thing that could happen to them is that we both we get into a car accident and die right now, and they have the last pictures of. You know, like that. Yeah, it's true. It's not beautiful. Like it's, it's yeah, not that's lovely. so true. Yeah, if it's outrageous, I, mean, it's you know, I don't care. But it's just like Dana. Hmm. One time, I walk into a restaurant and there's all these like super famous people, and it's you know, obviously they told me later women sell better, you know, because they get in all the magazines and what they're wearing and all. That. So I walk in and I go, nothing, guys. <laughs> and then he does it from the waist. He he has his camera and just from his waist goes dish dish. <laughs> <laughs> two flashes and I go you don't even lift it up to your eye and look through it and he goes no I know what I'm doing and I go uh, well I better see that somewhere oh we're sad little celebrities I, I remember scary. Jimmy Kimmel um, he he said that he actually overheard like his show had just started and but he, he was early on in his you know like this, his talk show had just started and he got like paparazzi and then he walked pat around the corner and walked past the same guy that took his picture 
and he was on the phone and he overheard him go like, man, it's a really slow day. <laughs> <laughs> It's so it's such a it, they always check you to remind you what level you are in the business. It's so sickening. Do your feelings get hurt easily in show business, Sarah? Or you feel you're tougher than you used to be? I don't think so really anymore. I still mm-hmm. you know, like I get fired from things or unhired from things and I I don't take it too personally. I got I got hired the the this writer director wrote, wrote this series that's coming out on a streaming platform. And <laughs> Nice in general. He, he Great. Per, you know, he emailed me and said, will you play this role? It's a rabbi and it's like a drama, you know? And mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, that's cool. You know, it's like this, you know, there's like scenes underwater and it's, it's like this futuristic, whatever. Nice. And it's, it has a whole, she's in other episodes, but then she has like one whole episode. And I was like, great. And I'm, you know, I have the script and I'm, there's dates and everything. And then he emails me back and he said, Sarah, I'm, so horrified the something plus people (laughs) um said Uh no and i i didn't know that was even a thing like i thought i could hire anyone i wanted but they said no and i go don't worry you know for in a way it like feels like relief like you know when people cancel plans and you're like, ah, you know, yeah. like it's, oh, yeah. it's relief because I, you know, of course I stress about it because I want to do a good job. But I mean, part of me is like, I, I don't understand why. And then part of me does understand why. So I just, you know. Well, do you like, so do you get, when you get hired for corporate gigs or anything, do, do you have to tell them ahead of time? Does, does your, do they know what they're getting sometimes or do you adapt to a situation? Because with me, sometimes they go, adapt. They, oh yeah, they know what they're getting, right? So they go, they you think they you. know what they want. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was definitely a time where I would have my manager, like when I did the TED talk that they then <laughs> wouldn't post. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, what? That's what I, I had my manager call back three <laughs> different times and say, she just wants to make sure you, cause she loves TED talks and she, you know, I always watch them with my mom and she just wants to make sure you know what she is and what she does and. I really, in earnest, like planned the whole 18 minutes. I was so excited and it did well and the crowd loved it. But yeah, they wouldn't post it for many years. And And, uh, can I ask why? I mean, why why did they not want to post it? I don't know, but it was a whole long drama where the the head of the TED Talks. Ted um, Sarandos. Who had called and like (laughs) reassured me, we want you. It's about all different voices. Mm-hmm. Oh my yeah. gosh! Like that was awful. <laughs> <laughs> like million followers, and I was just like covering their ass. Yeah, it was so shitty. He's apologized uh, many times since over the years because, uh, you know, I. But I, you know, it, you, when you mess with a comedian, it's hard because then I was like talked about it on like real time with Bill Maher. This was like yeah. ten years ago, probably. <laughs> you know, it like it murdered him, and and um. He called my manager. Was like, could we have a truce? You know, yeah. like, <laughs> sure, of course. Yeah. You know, I I did it in such earnest, and then like, yeah, I, I mean, I yeah. Sometimes someone will tell you at a corporate day to CEO or something. Oh yeah, you go blue, man. Say, go kid. You know, say fuck whatever you want. You're like, well, okay, I don't even use fuck that much, but I dropped a few. And then the booker is kind of like, not good, man, not good. You know, I go, but the CEO told me to do it. They're like, that guy didn't even work there. I've had people come backstage and go, <laughs> yeah. just fuck around. And I go, what do you do here? He goes, oh, I'm friends with the uh, guy that booked you. I'm like, oh, well, I don't know if I'm going to be going by you because you're leaving right after. And then I have to deal with, they don't want to pay you. I mean, yeah, I don't want to disrespect anyone. And like those corporate gigs are like, you know, they suck. And, <laughs> and I appreciate them so much because they're just like, it's like how famous people used to do commercials in Japan. Like it's just this. Yes. hidden thing where you make money you know and you, you can, make yeah. more make than a regular some, gig like three the times the best you can do Whatever. is like a C plus then you walk out of there so happy yeah and they go oh we want you to be crazy and then they're like you know <laughs> yeah, that when it. you talk about coming in God's mouth or something <laughs> I know oh you bit on that too I got one of those coming in God's <laughs> mouth <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Ask her something good, Dana. Um, I don't something know. good. Meow, meow. I look at your stuff today. I saw you on Conan in 93. 
Oh my god! And uh, one thing that hit me is like they you're talk like this. <laughs> You were so cute and so sweet and innocent. It was like, it really was charming. But uh, you were like 21 or two. You started stand-up at 17. So within four years, you're on television. That's pretty yeah. good. How did you, like, what, how, did you, how did you get that good that fast? A lot of people, it takes 10 years. Were you headlining clubs when you went on Conan or... No, no. You, they no. just saw you at the improv. I was just doing and- set spots around town and okay. stuff. And but I, yeah, I got. You know, I'm from New Hampshire, so but like I went to this high school where they had assemblies, and they'd let me do like three minutes, you know, Fun. at assemblies and stuff. Or like my math teacher would let me tell like one joke at the beginning of class, and then I had to be quiet. You know? <laughs> and that was our deal. But. um and then I, but when I moved to New York, I, I went to NYU and I just went for one year because I, I've always been a very good student. I've never not done my homework, you know, but then I was working at a comedy club, passing out flyers from like 4 p.m. to uh, 2 a.m. every day and then going to classes and I was fa- sleeping through my classes and it, I'm not like that student. Like I was like <laughs> pinching myself, trying to stay awake. I couldn't keep my eyes open and I... So I, my dad said, if you quit college, I'll pay your like rent and utilities, it was like wow. 300, $450 for the next three years. Like it's your sophomore, junior, senior year, and then you're on your own. So okay. it was a great deal because I did steal classes because I had all these like numb nuts friends that were like rich and going to NYU and didn't even want to go to classes, you know, so mm-hmm. it, but um, then I could just really focus on stand up, and then by the time I would have been a, would have graduated, I was working with you on Saturday Night Live. But you know, I mean, I was only there one year, and then I got fired, and then for a while I didn't know if I was in show business anymore. <laughs> were, were you kind of like Woody Allen, Woody Allen, Stephen Wright sort of influence in the early days, or who was who were you kind of looking up to as a stand up when you started? I mean, Steve Martin was my or Steve Martin idol, yeah, yeah. you know, like I yeah. It's funny because in my the the house I grew up in, my room was like the attic, and uh, on the ceiling in pencil I wrote "I love Steve Martin" with a heart around it, and uh, oh. it always was there. And now, then my mom died, and my we my sister sold the house, and they the realtor uh, came to one of my shows in Boston and brought me a picture. They redid the whole house, but they saved that one square Aww. of ceiling, so it's still there. Wow. He Good was story. a big one for me, too. I knew all the albums. and yeah. It was the first thing I was memorizing. Oh, my God. I, I just love him so much. And But I, I don't know that I was like him. I, I don't know who I was. I imitated so all the people influenced around me in the beginning before I Dice. saw Dice. My- you remind me of Dice. Like, I took hey. When I see my early stuff, I'm like, they talk like this today. I'm just really earnest. <laughs> and, you know, I, the great uh, one-liners, really though. Well. <laughs> great one-liners, though, which I can't write. So when someone writes a great one-liner... You know, like Woody Allen or Stephen Wright, those two. And you could yeah, you have that oh, yeah. skill set. So Yeah, my lo- mom had a Woody Allen double album that where he's mm-hmm. at like a nightclub, you know, he says like uh, this watch is very special to me. My uncle on his deathbed sold me this watch. <laughs> yeah. It's all that misdirection. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know. Oh, so they saw you. Had you done any gigs like when I was doing stand up, I had only been in, I only got to New York once. At my friend hired me to open for her company at something. Open for Ray Charles at their... It was a corporate gig, I actually. I got 1500 bucks. I bombed miserably, but I had never even been to New York. And then I went back. And then by the time I got SNL, I'd really maybe only been there twice. Were you ever going out west and doing gigs? Or is, everything's pretty much back east in stand-up, right? No, I had done... Um, no, I had done two things in Los Angeles. I did... Comic Strip Live and Evening yeah. at the Improv. So oh, they had wow. like that tape, you know. Oh, yeah. I saw that. And was it Marcy or who's, who brought you in to see Lauren? Or did they, they just Marcy, call you? Uh, um, Marcy Klein or? Marcy Klein. I, but I met with Lauren and Jim Downey in, uh, in LA. I met with Lauren in LA because he was at Paramount and 
And uh, I remember I had just read like Saturday night. So I just like, I went into the meeting with Lauren and just asked him a million questions, you know, uh-huh. and I feel like that was like a, a good move because he, yeah. he's a rock <laughs> tour, you know? Yeah, yeah. sure. And, um, Oh, you read the book. Oh, that's uh, nice. che- Chevy was always like that. You know, I, I so. remember I asked the cute, I go like, why are you, you're a performer. Like, why didn't you know what I mean? I don't like I, but, um, <laughs> you, you know, like, so, but, and then they invited me to the Coneheads premiere. Nice. And that's Funny. when I found out I got, I, I was hired as a writer. Oh, I was there. I was there. And you know, there weren't phones or anything. So I was like, I just went to the bathroom and sat in a stall and was like, Oh, I just want to call my mom, you know? <laughs> yeah, and you uh, got so they told you at the Conan's premiere, and then you didn't know what to do yeah. with that. You're like, I can't even focus on this <laughs> stupid movie. <laughs> oh, so well, fun! Wow. So what did you? So your first week there, I mean, who did you hook up with? I mean, did you have uh, friends right away, or someone you knew from stand up, or were you like an oh, alo- yeah, alone island? I was hired with David Tell and Jay Moore. I knew those oh. two from stand up. Mm-hmm. And Norm McDonald's was hired too, who I loved, but I didn't know him well. And we, you know, I got to know him there. So you came yeah. in with three other newbies, right? So there were four of you that were coming in. Yeah, new. but I was um, the first day Lauren like matched me up with these three writers mm. who were also my age and new Dave Mandel, yep. Lou Morton, Steve Luckner, who's become like a right wing. He found his little niche and, uh, you know, oh, look, so, but, uh, remember, you know, when show business them. doesn't give you what you feel you have earned because you went to the Harper Lampoon, it, it can make you bitter. And then you go, oh, go the niche. right finds me real funny. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I'll look you know up. where the love is. I'm fascinated. Uh-huh. How do you spell that? Steve? Oh, oh I know. Uh, yeah. But anyway, they he said, oh, you all hang out. You're all you're all 22. And, you know, and they're all from Harvard. And we spent the whole day together. We went to like a ca- the cafeteria, which I don't think I ever went to again. And and at the <laughs> ho- end of the whole day of hanging out, I remember one of them was like, so you're, what are you, like a typist? They thought I was one of the typists. And I was just like, <laughs> no, I'm a writer like you, you fucking asshole. <laughs> wow, what? <laughs> they they yeah. don't realize there was like a madman room where there was four girls typing the sketches for you. Yeah, I mean computers yeah. existed, but not there. It was like we you wrote in longhand on yeah. pads, and it yep. looked crazy, and I can't believe anyone can follow it. And then these like genius typists in a room yeah. of typists, Claire, <laughs> like an army. It was yeah, like they so go old through. Timing. It. Ellie, Claire. Uh, I remember writing on those uh, legal pads because you just had like a wooden desk and a legal pad. And they're like, okay, <laughs> see it read through. And you go, I, what am I doing here? I don't even know how to write a sketch. I don't know anything. And you got to figure out as you go. I guess Dana was gone when you got there. Yeah, he had just left. And I remember you, I saw you, you came back one day and you came down like an elevator that I had never seen before and got off of it. And I saw you walk with a few people and I was like, <laughs> really? <laughs> Yeah. A secret elevator? You came back it, for a victory. To me it was. I still, no one tells you your way around. No one tells you how things no. work. Like, I remember I got my first sketch that I had written by myself on, and I was so excited. John Malkovich was the host, and it went great in dress rehearsal. And then mm-hmm. this was my first time, like, having something. So then we're all sitting, like, on the floor in Lauren's office after dress. And yeah. I remember I was on the floor, and Malkovich was sitting in a chair like next to me high up and he looks down and he goes, I'm so sorry. I, I really messed up a line and dress. And I go, don't worry about it. You'll, you'll get it on the air. It'll be great. And Mike Myers goes, it's cut. Look, it's on the left side of that line. <laughs> it's like, Shaw, it's cut. You know, right? I have no Shaw. idea. Like I, I just, no one tells you, you just, you're thrown in, you know, like. Right. You, know. you walk in after dress and they had picked the, for the audience, they pick the sketches while you sweat it out outside the door. And then they finally open it and go, you can go in. And then you walk in and you immediately look at the wall mm-hmm. and like three sketches are moved out. Like they got caught, maybe an yeah, update I piece. I had no I know, idea. I'm saying, That's how I learned that. Right. Yeah. So you sit down and, uh, and then you go, oh, look behind you, Sarah. It's cut. And no one ever goes, here's how it works. You walk in and you look and then you still try to put on a brave face, <laughs> even though you're not going to be in the show. And so you just sit on the floor while they do a whole meeting and all you can think of is, I'm not even in this one. Why but it was, what am I doing? you know, I, I, it was like, 
I did enjoy being there. I mean, in a million years, I didn't know I was not coming back. So I'm ready <laughs> to get the next season. I'm thinking like, this is going to be my no, year. I mean, I don't know why. I, I, you so know what? Funny. I never think I'm getting fired. Like even still. And I still do. You know, I do all the time. You know, I get <laughs> yeah. fired a lot, but I still get fired from things, you know. And uh, like before anything even happens. But yeah, I was, I was, yeah, it had never occurred to me. You know, you're not a big compromiser, it doesn't seem. So you do your act, and I've seen you recently even go on, and I always just like to sit back and watch and see what you're coming up with. Um, and it's always fun to see that you're still, you still try, you still work hard. I, I do the same thing when I do stand-up. I still like it. I still try. It's fun oh to get God. it back up there. And I like when you crawl on the piano. I like when you, uh, you just oh, have your own u- unique thing. And then your jokes are always so clever. I go, God damn, but at least... It's not like, oh, this is this type of comedian that everyone's doing. You're always got your angle. And that's why when people might fire you, it's it's in a weird way a compliment, maybe 1% a compliment, but um, <laughs> <laughs> that they go, this, she's just thinking out of the box, which is what you want from someone, but they don't really handle it well. They go, no, no, this, we want the regular stuff. We you come off so confident, Sarah. I just wonder yeah. if. Do you have situations coming up or in stand up sometimes like me? I just go mayday, mayday. I must kill desperate eyes, you know. <laughs> mayday, all, all, mayday. Not going to do it. I, I, you know, but you always <laughs> seem, you know what I mean? Just like, well, that's better. But you seem serene and confident. It's very pleasant to watch. And I think part of the reason your specials were so, so well received is because that you're not pushing ever. You're letting the audience come to you. I mean, is that intentional? It's just your nature or, because you do seem so calm and confident doing stand-up. I mean, I don't really think about, I don't feel that way, you know, but I definitely have learned from so many people. Like when you said that, it makes me think of, I remember seeing Chris Rock at the comic strip years Mm -hmm. ago. And it was yeah. before he was who he is now, like pacing and louder and like, mm-hmm. you know, he hadn't, everyone changes and grows and, you know, but he was quiet on stage mm-hmm. and he'd go on and like the comic strip was like, it, it's like a zoo. Like people are, the audiences are crazy, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and he, he would just, um, just start and, and not be loud to get the audience mm-hmm. to hear him. Mm-hmm. So it was like there was no desperation. And if they if the audience missed the first two or three jokes, that's their problem. And so they all got quiet and leaned in. And I go, I noticed it. You know, I was like, oh, wow, he's so much more powerful being quiet than going like, you know, I would be like, hey, everyone. um, um, uh, <laughs> Dogs are funny. Down, you know, yeah. <laughs> and it, that's like what a teacher would do. Like it, it, it's, mm-hmm. it's it, you can it's sweaty like there's you yeah. can. An audience can, they don't know, they couldn't probably articulate this, but like an audience can smell desperation, you know? So Mm. it doesn't help you to like, you've got to get yourself in a place where you're like, all right, not for everyone, but, uh, the last thing I always say right before I got, if I remember to remember it is have fun. And I remember telling John Lovitzak, he credits me with coaching him, but I only gave him a couple tips, but it's very sweet about it. I said, John, remember, you got to have fun right before you go out. Thank you for saying that. It saved me so much time. You know, and the other it thing was a huge difference to remember that massive. You can forget in a second and then you're five minutes in and you realize I'm not having fun right now. What 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 happened? You and know, because you got up on it. They pick it up. But um, John also but they, said you're honest. They also like we appreciate that. Like I, I've got I feel like there have been a few times where I'm like, for some reason or whatever's going on in my life. And I'm not a big crier. I was like sobbing that day and thinking like, <laughs> and then like thinking about how I have a spot that night. just being like, I don't feel funny. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> nothing's funny. And those are always nights I have good. Do you, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you're always surprised that you have a good set that night. Cause there's something like cathartic comes out or I don't know. The it's like when you're sick and you got to do a set. And then you have a great set because you go, I just got to do the set. I don't have to kill or not kill. There's no pressure. I'm just lucky I'm here. I have bronchitis, you know? So, yes. but. Oh, Sarah, I got a question. When you go up sometimes, Dana, she oh, brings a. Dana, and that might be an issue for you too. What did I do? Hmm. 
You did interrupt Dana. I did, but I thought he was finished with his. We're, we we like to interrupt each other. We feel it's a good oh, good okay. en- good energy. David, okay. David, okay. go ahead. My question is David Spade because just made me think of this, but we we do it all the time. Um, you have sometimes a notebook when you go up or a pad, you know, mm-hmm. and and do you think sometimes it puts less pressure on jokes because I sometimes rarely. But because I want to read it, I, I want to get it right. Like, I'll just go, hey, I'm going to do this. And it, it's almost funnier to them that I have no belief yes. in it, sort of. And then later I do it without it. And it doesn't work as well. I'll tell you, I, I think that's such a... I always bring a notebook because I think I have brain damage from uh, so much like marijuana use. Or I don't know, like, <laughs> I, think, I, I feel like I'm getting like early... I, I'm so terrified of getting dementia, but I... So I, you know, and I want to just be able to be loose, but I, mm-hmm. I can't be loose if I'm like reaching for like, you know what I mean? At a certain yeah. point when you're on the road, you remember everything, but, but I do concede that having a notebook mm-hmm. gets you a lot of, um, because they feel like you're working on stuff that it has if they have a it's a, the jokes have a feeling of immediacy that give mm-hmm. them a lot more credit for the audience mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. when yes. it's something like oh yeah i'm looking at my notebook but i do know this works you know <laughs> you know like it's so it sometimes i don't know but like you know but when but when you're trying new things they always give you like 10 times more leeway you know well yeah. i think that it wasn't it called the alt comedy you know and largo where you would comment on your act, comment, you know, be very open. You know, the first time I played in there, first couple of times, I felt very uncomfortable because I was like a road comic from the 80s. And then then I finally, I just had Nick Kroll interview me or anything where I'd be tipped off just doing bits. And so I think that you're kind of one of the, you know, the, the leaders of that movement in a way, that authenticity, or at least that's the vibe I get. You know, the audience feels like you're being very, very real with them and not just doing bits. Well, I always think like it's funny when either of you guys are like nervous at Largo because like you kill at Largo. They love comedy. They're like the the great thing about the audience there is they're they're just huge comedy fans. They just want to like drink you up however you want to serve it, you know, but it's Mm -hmm. like. Just because, like, what you do works on the road doesn't mean it won't kill at Largo. Like, it, it has to be some experimental, like, anti-comedy thing. or it, Not at all. Like, you know. Sometimes sometimes your heroes are in the wings. Like, Martin Short is there. Or Bill Hader is going to watch me do stand-up. People I really admire. And they kind of see how they know how the rabbit gets out of the hat because you're sort of working. So, I feel like in that situation, it's better to have loose notes. Here's what happened to me today. And go with it. But, um I like that style, so that's what I do now, but not at a corporate date. <laughs> Flanagan's coming over at 1230. That's oh. the guy from Largo. He runs Largo. Yeah, Flanny. I heard you guys talking about him. He's yeah, great so guy. sweet. Yeah, he's, he's as good think, as they come. Um, on SNL, would you change anything when you were there? Because you only did a year. You didn't have a prep because you remember, you, I think I thought I was coming back too. Uh was there anything you could have done while you were there or is it just the way it was going to be? I mean, I, yeah, I think it's just the way it was going to be. I did the best I could for my yeah. age and my experience, you know, like I, I know you're so young, very young. Did you do any update features? Cause it seems like if you're coming in there and you're not acclimated, I you can you always, some cause updates. that's like stand up in a way. Did you I do- did one update mm-hmm. and, but it was an update that like I had to submit and submit like, First, it was in dress, and then it got cut, and then, like, you know, people said, like, you can resubmit it or whatever, and then I remember Rob Schneider going, like, I can't believe you're shoving that update piece <laughs> down our throats again, and I was like, <laughs> my heart just, like, went in my stomach, you know, like. What are you doing? They that. don't want that. Come on. Come on. Gotta be it's, original. It's Sorry, got a stink Rob on Schneider. it. It's true to yeah, like, re- I didn't, re- And I wasn't, con- I was a kid, and I felt like I was working with grown-ups, and then mm-hmm. I felt like these grownups can be so mean. Like I didn't know <laughs> grownups were that way, you know, cause I had only been mm-hmm. known grownups to be like friends, parents, you know, <laughs> not like, like, um, colleagues, you know, if I got on that show at age 22, I would, I never would have lasted. 
I, I would not have had the confidence or the experience to do it at that age. You know, Eddie Murphy did it. He was amazing at 19. That's still like a shooting star. Oh, I can't, like one there's guy, never yeah. been anyone that confident at 19. But yeah, but for you, I think it was just your age because I think you... I think you should go back to that show now. And I was now. so <laughs> earnest. And I remember I wrote this sketch that like had some like, like um, said something like, you know, I tried, like I can't remember what it was, but it was like, had like, um, you know, it was about A like theme. racism or something. I was right. trying to like earnestly like use comedy to say something and which is <laughs> just not. And then, I, and I remember at one point I had Farley said like, no. Or something like that, like <laughs> the apostrophe O H, and he just went at the table. He just went, "Dough." No, <laughs> was, just, was it uh, a doy? Do you think he took a dive, or did he do it oh, on purpose? One hundred percent. Oh, that's it horrible. It was just like so. Oh, I, what a I you know, stab. It was just whatever. But I, I think I, my best there was um, like on punch up nights because I could. I mm -hmm. contributed well and mm -hmm. like punch ups. And I was so in love with Jim Downey. It's yeah. like heartbreakingly in love with him. But, you know, he was like a, you know. And, does, he, uh, does he know about this or is he hearing this from this oh, podcast? Oh, no, I'm sure. Oh. I, I'm sure I came on very strong in my own way. But I was like, he was like a grown up, you know. And But I remember writing a sketch and saying, like, can you help me with it? And he said, yeah. And I think it was when martin lawrence was hosting because mm -hmm. his friend wrote there and was like came uh yeah. bowman or i don't know i can't remember john bowman. one of martin's friends yeah. maybe oh. no one of jim downey's friends oh, so okay. then they were hanging out in his office and he said just wait outside my office until i'm done here and i fell asleep and then the, it, i woke up and it was the morning and he oh, wow. was just coming out and i go are, are you ready for me and he's like for what? And I go, I gave you my skit script script. And he's like, I don't, I don't know. I don't have it. Oh. <laughs> Downy. But I mean, you know, I love him though. I mean, of course I still love him. It's I like can't. a teacher. It's like you being like a college girl and that's your professor. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Jim, uh, Jim is uh, definitely one of the smartest people I've ever met. I met a lot oh of smart God, people. Oh my God. I loved him so much. Yeah. And, uh, but it was a different time for sure. Wouldn't you say, David, a different time? A thousand percent. I mean, didn't you stab Franken for some reason? I did accidentally. <laughs> I just I, read that. <laughs> Stabbed out Franken? <laughs> okay, so I only for some <laughs> reason like, okay. sat next to him at, at um, table at um, mm -hmm. Punch Up. And you know, they had those really sharp pencils and a big thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I was like leaning back and like I had my pencils all sharp and he had like a really big like fro, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. big Jewish hair. And um, I remember just like my brain was drifting and I just thought like, oh, I could like stab this pencil through his hair. Mm -hmm. and, but what people saw was I just turned and stabbed him and I hit his temple. Oh my and it looked God. insane. It looked like I stabbed him in the temple. And I remember him just going like, oh, why? Uh, sorry. That's what he said, why? Yeah, why? That's what he said, why? And I couldn't answer because I was... Laughing so hard and tears were pouring down my face and I looked like a crazy person that just stabbed Al Franken and then laughed maniacally. Oh man. I couldn't like put into words like, oh, in my head it would go through your hair. You know, it's all crazy. There's no I'm not crazy way to explain that. I wish you, I wish I would overlapped with you for a year because yeah Me we could we could I would have had you on Church Chat we would have had you on Wayne's World we would have had you on Hans and Franz Ooh, you think that now but it I don't feels know. like such a waste because you're such a smart writer that it just wasn't the time for you to hatch all these things because later in your life I think your stand up is also known for being very personal and you say so many things about your life and anything you're thinking you pretty much say it seems so. Or a lot of it. That's such. Yeah, but you have to remember, like I wasn't me now. Then no, I'm saying it's kind like, of my just. My sketches are terrible. I it was read undercooked. Them. They're not good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think SNL now, like you're saying about racism stuff. <laughs> SNL now does do a lot of personalized things, and they do do a lot of political things or what people are thinking or people take a stand on stuff. But back then, like you're saying, it was a different time. Of course, on every front, it was sort of different. 
you know. Mm-hmm. And I'm so exhausted with like things that have something to say, which I do <laughs> like. But I love being just aggressively dumb and silly right. more than anything. I know? told someone I was like, my comedy is not important. And in this day and age, it feels it like it's got to be important. And then you go, you know, oh, I'm just is trying your to get comedy laughs. Is important because your comedy is important because it's it's not that it's. It's not lowest common denominator. It's genuinely both of you so belly laugh funny and everyone can enjoy it. Like it doesn't divide anyone, which is massively important. I uh, think. I, I, yeah. I mean, you, I, I appreciate it more and more all the time because life beats the shit out of you and you have people come up to you and maybe if you're 35 or something, they say, I really needed that tonight, but now it resonates with me. So if you can get someone to belly laugh, cause you can't worry and belly laugh at the same time. I mean, it's brain yeah. brain candy, like watching a great show or watching the movie Marry Me, which my wife and I <laughs> loved doing that movie. Well, you know what's uh, funny about that? It's so good that they held it for so long because by the time it came out, you know, even like cynical fucks like us were like, yeah, I just want to feel good for an hour. <laughs> like, Really ready to watch that movie, yes, because totally. of the pandemic and Ukraine or whatever. It was just like, and then you were just the perfect sidekick in the movie. Like, didn't every line just land perfectly? But anyway, um, can you want to talk therapy for a little bit? <laughs> yeah. Only fans. I'll give you I'll give you top picks. I used to wet the bed, too, for your book. You did? Yeah, oh yeah. I was a champ. <laughs> for how, when did you stop? Uh, you know, probably somewhere around 12 to 14, I think. Um, the story I remember the most is there were five kids, two parents, and we're in a Cadillac going, driving through Montana, old-fashioned Cadillac, and we couldn't find a hotel, so we had to sleep in the car that night. It was a three-seater 1958 Cadillac. So I got the spot where the transmission goes, you know, behind the seat, the hump. I'm mm-hmm. in a sleeping bag in the hump, and then the next thing I know, waking up, is I hear my brother and my mom looking down at me and talking about this giant wet spot on the sleeping bag. So like, yeah, I guess he's, well, should we wake him up? I don't know. I, I went to bed and I'd heard that. And there there was just no dignified way to get out of that wet bag. <laughs> you unzip it, you stand up. Okay, you got to own it. But, and uh, you know, I, I never felt that bad about it though. Cause I just thought I was just a heavy sleeper. I didn't feel uh, shame. It what was about brutal. You? Like sleepovers were terrifying. I just like pinch myself awake all night, you know, like, and I, I, yeah, but I that, did that have was these bad. friends that were twins, Lori and Amy Martin. They were my best friends and they knew I was a bedwetter. So, you know, and, but I would really try and like their mom would wake me up before she went to bed and like mm-hmm. take me to pee and stuff. But so one night I remember waking up in Amy's room on my sleeping bag and I had wet and my heart was pounding. I didn't know what to do. So I flipped it. Yeah. (laughs) So the circle was up. And I, so then when Amy came in, I go, I went to bed, but it went up. So you don't have to tell your parents, you know, like it didn't get on the floor. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, um, Sometimes you would just move over and sleep on the dry side. Yeah. And just let it go. That feeling when you wake up and you're like, you feel warm and you're like, "Mm, Mm -hmm. did I wet the bed? And then you'd have to move just a little bit. And if you felt that whoosh of cold air, you knew that you peed. You know, it was like so awful. I remember I, my first (laughs) sleepover party was at this girl's house and the mother was a fucking cunt. And the worst thing was, this is actually in my musical, uh, um, I have a musical (laughs) opening April 30th in New York Uh and it's called The Bedwetter and I'm not in it, it's the year I'm 10, so it's like this little girl and it has this scene in it where I, I didn't know it was a sleepover and then they're like, oh, you have to sleep over, you know? And then I tried to like tell my mom and and they're all listening and she's like, are you sure you want to sleep over? And I have to say yes, because they're on the other line, like listening. And then I have to borrow pajamas. Her mother (laughs) made her daughter. She was like a pageant mom. So I'm in these like, I'm seven and wearing these sexy harem pajamas (laughs) and sleeping in their sleeping bag. And I wake up drenched and I'm so horrified. And I just am like, from having to go to sleepover camp every year, I I had just had this mechanism of disassociation where I just like got changed with all the other girls and it was wet, but I just, it probably stank. I just didn't acknowledge it. 
And then Heather's wow. mom walks in and she steps <laughs> right in my wet clothes. Oh. And this is what a mother of seven year olds does. She picks up the wet clothes and she goes, who did this? <laughs> and wow. I'm just standing there like out of body. And I swear to God, it's 1978 or I don't know when it was. Mm -hmm. And the, just as I'm thinking like, am I supposed to say something or can I just, I'm not going to. And then the father came in and went, Elvis died. <laughs> and it, like Elvis Presley dying saved my life. Cause I was able to just like get picked up and get out of there while they were like, so upset. The King died. God, you know, what, that's uh, one of those non sequiturs that Elvis saved that humiliation. Did you wet the bed every night then? Cause mine was more interstitial, but it was fairly consistent. It was a lot of the time, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, and I, it was until I was like fifteen, <laughs> and then a couple of times <laughs> okay. as an adult. Like when I got fired from Saturday Night Live, I remember I wet the bed like three times in that week, and it was with three different in three different men's beds. <laughs> oh wow! What? Yeah, because I you know I liked um, sex. I, it was so new to me. I lost my virginity as a as a comedian. I was nineteen. So I was just like, after that, I loved it. And I was like, what do his balls look like? What do his balls look like? What do his balls look like? Now, did you, um, were your friends like that as well at 19? Like, would you call yourself promiscuous at that point? Uh, or once, When I lost my virginity at 19, like through the year of being 20. Yeah. Yes. I like kept Noxema in my backpack so I could wash my face wherever I landed. <laughs> but um, I just don't regret it. I got a terrible reputation. I was a slut. Meanwhile, all the guys are fucking different waitresses every single night. You know. Well, yeah, there's a I definite. I loved definite. these guys. I know all of them still. That's it. I well, you I know just, they don't. It's not like something from my past because they're comedians. Yeah, yeah, they're your friends now. Wow, that's cool. I like that. I, I always thought it was a double standard. Why why do women, they, they have a one night stand, they're a slut. Oh yeah, I was the guys a whore, stuck. but all these guys that fuck every waitress on the road are were just like, cool, no, no problem. And they <laughs> fucked all the same girls. And Wow. So when did you, what, what are you looking for? Because just casually, we as a public are fans of yours. We sort of know your different relationships. And do you, has it evolved who you look for or is it whimsical or are you out there or are you currently in a relationship? I'm just. Oh, no, I'm, I, yeah, I, I'm, I have a, a live in love. Okay. So how many, how much, uh, well, how's it going? <laughs> Good. I love him. He's great. I, you know, I really felt like I was at a, you know, after my 20th year, I was just in like back to back long term relationships. Right. So know? it was that one crazy year of just wanting to experiment. And then, yeah, and then I you wanted my to oats. I should have. I did yeah. everything right, in my opinion. But, you know, um, yeah, he's great. He's he's a um, writer, producer. He's so funny. And um, I really was at a place where I was really felt done. Like, I, I just feel like I don't want to. I love love, but like, I don't want to share my bed anymore. I really, you know, I, I got to a place in the past few years before meeting him, like where I really became my own best friend. And I love being alone. I love mm -hmm. coming home and I love doing anything I want at all times and not disappointing anyone. You know, I really yeah. was into it. And then we met over the, like at the beginning of quarantine, like in the March, 2020 over um, playing video games, like um, playing um, Call of Duty online. Call of Duty online? Cool. Yeah, so every night at 7.05, we would meet online and kill Nazis together. And, um, you know, I knew him a little bit. We had mutual friends. He's, you know, he's a comedian and a writer. He was mm -hmm. the, he ran the Daily Show with Jon Stewart for a long time. Okay. And do you feel like you've matured or have more confidence in a relationship or how have you evolved? Uh, you know, yeah, because going into this one, it was really good because I had, I know what I want and don't want. And I could be very clear from the beginning and him too. We both, you know, like I, I've had a, I, I love my exes. I have good taste in men. I, I you know, I I, 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 I met several of them that you do have great, great taste in men. I do. Yeah. And, and, and I'm, I love, they're like, they become like brothers, you know, mm -hmm. as you, yeah. you know, and, and, um, and, and, uh, 
but but with the reason why they didn't work out, I don't know specifically each thing. I'm you know whatever, but. Mm-hmm. I always felt like I was disappointing. I, I tried. It's always my goal to be the best possible girlfriend. And yet yeah. I still felt like I was had that feeling like I'm disappointing this person in some way. Mm. And I just I don't want I'm not I would never cheat. I'm I have total uh, blinders, you know, not blind. Mm-hmm. I mean, in a good way, I would, you know, if I'm with yeah. someone, I don't see men, other men in a sexual mm-hmm. way at all. You know, I'm very devoted but i yeah somehow i would feel like oh i'm disappointing there was always something so it's nice to be with someone that i'm not i can just say like this is i'm at a point where this is how i want things and he can say the same and we we talk about stuff it is spade not on where were you where were you david did you have to make a sissy did you have to make a bm <laughs> we see him do you hear us we were just yeah. talking about relationships and love. and I think I do. Sorry, Sarah. Whatever. It happens. We were talking about pee and then everything. You crazy. sound like you're drunk, so it's like. Sarah, I'm so sorry that happened. No, I'm kidding. No, I, we had a situation here. I don't oh. want the people. In room 29, there was a. Oh. Um, we're, we're just talking about relationships and uh, how Sarah's evolved uh, and has a, a live-in lover. And what, what how's that going? Uh, you know, I've been married for 40 years, you know, yeah. to six different women. But my point is this. No. I say that every week. My only joke I ever wrote. But I, I do think with mine, it was uh, conflict, you know, afra- afraid of conflict. And then you bury the resentment. You, you're starting to carry anger around that you don't even know because you don't. Is this the ant hill I die on right now, or should I let it go by? So um, both my wife and I had five years of therapy, so we're we're great. We, we were always good, yeah. but we're better. Yeah, I mean that's what Rory and I we'd always go like face value. We, I don't want to meet a relationship where I have to decipher what you mean by what you say, or like sure, no, that's fine. Oh no, it, no, if I say it's fine, it's fine. And, you know, it's my responsibility to say like. I have a problem or with that if, you know, and not go like, Mm -hmm. okay, you know, I mean, none of, I just can't with that stuff. So we just go face value. Like, you know, what I say is what I mean. And that's how I would only expect you to take it, you know, and it cuts out a lot of bullshit. If you get into a place where you're actually both trying to open the door for the person and it's really organic, like I just really want to help my wife and she really wants to help me and we're codependent in a, in a positive way. If you have a narcissist and an empath and they get together, all hell breaks loose because the narcissist can't help it. They don't know they are and they start to harvest and use and abuse the empath. So would you? How, are, where are you on that gradient scale in your mind? You seem like an empath. <laughs> well, the narcissist would say, I'm the empath, right? <laughs> okay. But, um, it's so I, funny. Maybe because, it's destructive though too, but go ahead. You know that book yeah. by Alice Miller, I think it's called Drama of the Gifted Child. It's big for yes. <laughs> So I remember reading it and I met with a friend for lunch and I go, oh, I just read this book. It's called Drama of the Gifted Child. And she goes, oh, I heard a really interesting story about that. It's originally titled Drama of the Narcissistic Child, but they realized the people that would mm-hmm. need to read it wouldn't. So they, mm-hmm. <laughs> they named it Drama of the mm-hmm. Gifted Child. And then I was like a little deflated and also like it really made me go like, oh, wow. Yeah. But, but I would say just for myself, uh, empathetic people can be dysfunctional and passive aggressive and people pleasing. Like I didn't even think that is self congratulatory and we all have a, a combo, but I did learn in therapy that, um, you know, it's very, very good to try to get in touch with saying no and your inner narcissist. If you're, you want some of that going, in other words, you draw boundaries. This is it. I won't take any more of this. And so that really helped me with that. Those kind of patterns from my childhood. Crazy parents, crazy everything. So. It's funny. Somebody called into my podcast yesterday about sex workers, like just saying like, um, you know, I, I don't know how to feel about like porn and sex workers like they should, you know, do what they want, but aren't a lot of them have like really traumatic pasts and, you know, and I, you know, I don't know the answer to this, but I was talking about it. I go like, it's so funny because yes, they probably have common trauma, but so do comedians. So do 
actors, so do uh, politicians. Yeah. They have common traumas that drive them to want to do the X, Y, or Z, you know? Yeah. All right, guys. So, well, I want to mention S Sarah Silverman's podcast, which I watch. And That's it's really right. fun on YouTube, you know? Oh, my gosh. So you've been doing that, like, for during the pandemic, a couple hundred shows? or That's when I started. I was like, I couldn't do stand-up. I couldn't fathom doing stand-up on Zoom, like, you know? And then yeah. I was like, yeah. I, I, I'm going to have to do a podcast because I, you know, I didn't know where to put this or, like, to generate, even to, like, make a yeah. living is stand-up, you know? Yeah, and keep your mind sharp by, you know, improvising and stuff like that. Yeah, I really, so. I like it. I mean, it just, the only thing about it is that it's never ending. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. I think I just did. You don't get a bunch of episodes work. and then take a month off, or you're just consistently churning them kind of? Um, Like, I just shot this show and I had to take two or three weeks off. So, but what I do is I talk forever and then they take out <laughs> anything that can be evergreen and save it. So I do mm -hmm. like stockpile stuff that isn't um, like from this moment. And then like I'm, when I go to New York to do the musical, the bedwetter, which opens April 30th at the Atlantic theater. Um, Based on your book. Yeah. E yeah. It's uh, a little yeah, bit. Yeah. One year. And uh, BB Newworth is playing my Nana. Oh, nice. she's incredible. <laughs> I was thinking she's too old to play 10. Yeah, no, she's like a young, sexy Nana from like a Boston <laughs> accent. And Sarah, you get calls on voicemail and then you listen to them and answer them, right? Yeah. So, so, so we, so we'll bank, I like banked some when I did my last one, I did like a lot, a ton of ads. The ads are mm -hmm. a little soul killing, but like I do look through them and like if they really have a bad, like better business bureau grade or something, I say no, but I do a lot, you know, a lot of them. I kind of like doing them. I don't know why. <laughs> it doesn't. It's fun because you get to have like be a broadcaster. Yeah they, yeah, they seem fun. Remember when Johnny Carson would hold up Alpo and stuff like that? You know, oh, it yeah. seems kind of just to go right at it. But it's really fun to fun to watch that show. And your clothes change a lot, I guess, because they do edits. Because like you have a blue shirt on, and then they do a cut, and then you have a yellow sweater on stuff. Yeah, because it doesn't matter with podcasts. Nobody cares. Mostly no. people hear it audio if they watch it on YouTube. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you'll see me in different outfits because it will be yeah. like stuff from this week, that week, this week. You know, like more evergreen things will just be mm -hmm. from other weeks where I just go and go and go, you know, but, um, yeah. yeah, the calls are like, sometimes they're so sad and I, you know, and I have to remember, like, I have to try to be funny at some point in this episode this is like, but I also feel like, I'm so point. sorry. You're, you know, grandmother. Sometimes you're just giving your great asshole. serious advice, which is kind of, kind of cool. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's, actually... funny. it's funny. Cause I like, I did like, this more political show on Hulu. And then I did a pilot for a political show on HBO. And I, I, you know, again, I'm like shocked when they don't pick it up. I'm like, what? I always <laughs> think I'm putting gold in their lap because I like it, you know? And, but now I have no desire to do a play. I just want to do dumb, silly stuff because I've got the podcast to talk about whatever I want to talk about. And, you know, I, agree. I just want to laugh. Big silly stuff that's just, uh, you know, I watched uh, the second Pink Panther because my mother in law was in town, Love Slapstick with Peter Sellers, uh, Revenge of the Pink Panther. And it was just seeing her laugh at 91 from Dublin, belly laughing, crazy. And, and then I started to do it, you know, it's such a joy, you know, those kinds uh. of old fashioned movies, just silly, big set pieces that are relentlessly. Everything that could go wrong does go wrong. And Peter Sellers with his whole thing. Anyway. That's like Super um, Dave. Like he was like the. Yeah. He, he was. was for me like I never was really into physical comedy. But Super Dave is total physical comedy. And I. He made me laugh so hard. Yeah. yeah he was. You knew what was coming. But it didn't, <laughs> it didn't, it didn't matter. matter. It didn't matter. <laughs> There's something primal about it. You know, Ugh. falling down and stuff, you know. Yeah, my niece sent me a, a video she took of my dad. She showed him like a, a triumph, the insult comic dog like special. Yeah. And he was I thought he was gonna die. He was laughing so hard. The Star Wars one or the dog show. I one. love the Star Wars one, but yeah. it was like a political special he had done. 
Yeah, Robert Smigel strikes again. Oh my god! Yeah, those are funny. They're just so yeah. Man, he's talking to the guy in the Darth Vader thing. He's like, "What does this button do? Call your mom to pick you up." (laughs) 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 That's the best one. Um, Uh, All right, we should let Sarah go. She's been a good sport. She's got a big night tonight. I do. No, (laughs) no, no, I don't know. I was just asking. What are you going to do after we finish this podcast? Yeah. Lanny's coming over to see my house because I I bought, just bought my first ever house. Woo! Yeah, so he's coming over and we're gonna have a little lunchy and then not, and then walk the dogs. Whatever. Let's end on end it earlier when it was better. <laughs> when it was you know when I talked to Jonathan Katz, he told me a joke he had just made up and it was so <laughs> funny. He said, um, <laughs> "You know, Sarah, I think we can all hmm. agree the." Worst people in the world are child pornographers. I go, yeah. And he goes, I think they should be prosecuted as adults. <laughs> <laughs> you felt like that's such a perfect joke. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, Sarah Let's Silverman, on David Spade. You got a joke, to David? No. Mm. On, I don't think David. so. Okay, ready? Here's a joke. <laughs> He's always got some. I said, there's an, it's, an, it's the 90th anniversary. No. It's a 90-year-old couple. Oh, no. <laughs> you know it? No, and no. it's their six, 60th anniversary, and the wife wants to do something special. So she tells the guy to get in bed, and she's got a surprise room. So the 90-year-old woman, she goes in the, in the bathroom and gets naked, except for a cape. She puts on a cape. And then she pops out of the bathroom and gets to the foot of the bed and goes, super pussy. And he goes, I'll take the soup. <laughs> all right you got that one all right Sa- sarah silverman sarah, been a joy a everybody joy. loves you just take that to your to your i was soul. nervous to come on the show and i was listening and i wrote down something in case i didn't think of anything because i was listening <laughs> you're all talking about saturday night live and everything and i i had written one thing down which is not that but it's I, you know, when I worked there, I was always like in the fourth row in read throughs, like way in the back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I hosted one time and I, you know, you get to sit right next to Lauren and uh, I have like a terrible sound sensitivity, misophonia, like mouth sounds and stuff that like make me insane. The whole read through, Lauren is eating baby carrots. I was like out of body experience. Like it it makes me like, I can't even hear concentrate on anything. I tried to like slide the, the platter away. Like without anyone noticing, he pulls it back. And and I remember he would do that. And occasionally I'd say, what are you doing? He goes, he he goes, uh, Oh, what's up doc. Sorry. Bugs bunny. (laughs) (laughs) Bugs bunny. Lauren doing bugs bunny. So um, stupid. It's that thing of like you're chewing. That's funny. Audio sensory, bedwetting, tactile, bo- uh, new uh, live-in boyfriend, having fun. We said it all. We kind of we kind of did it all too. All right. Well, well thank you, right. Sarah. Okay. See. You. We'll we'll end it on one of these. All right. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> we have five Here. endings. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Sarah. Bye, hon. Fly on the Wall has been a presentation of Cadence 13. Please listen, then rate, review, and follow all episodes. Executive produced by Dana Carvey and David Spade, Chris Corcoran of Cadence 13, and Charlie Finan of Brillstein Entertainment. Production and engineering led by Greg Holtzman, Richard Cook, Serena Regan, and Chris Basil of Cadence 13. Rumor has it. Adele. I love Adele, yeah. She had- what a voice. Johnny Byrne, this is, your question was not about Adele, but you say, hi, David and Dana. I'm a 29-year-old comic from Salt Lake, not Mormon, uh, who has been in Chicago for five years and just moved to L.A. I'm sure you get this question a lot, but what advice would you have for someone who aspires to be on SNL? You know, that is hmm, a common question, a, but the only answer question, is, and John. I get the question a lot about, most about being comic is they have to find you. I think it, it's, there's no secret advice for me, maybe Dan has more. He's He knows more than me. But mm-hmm. if you're good, even other comics will help you get on other shows. Even people go, you're good. It's kind of a weird thing, but someone will say you're good and someone will say to their agent, maybe you should check this guy out. 
And just getting stage time is probably my best advice, as much as you can. Yeah, first of all, make sure it's a passion because show business will break your heart. They used to have people come to our college, San Francisco State, wasn't a real college, and they'd be like a regional actress or did a couple commercials. The first thing they'd always say is, if you can do anything else in your life besides show business, do that. Only do that if wow. you can't live without doing it. So first of all, you got to have the passion. Secondarily, you just got to live on stage. You got to either be a stand-up living on stage work on your material or go to the ground leads or second city do all the classes keep going networking but the main thing is the passion and always look at your feet don't look at i'm making it or while well, make it forget future tripping just like how good am i today am i a little bit better today yeah. than it was i yesterday people say i'm gonna I, do this it is for free. one year this is free i'm not free gonna advice. charge anyone for this if I, people say <laughs> I, I i'm gonna try it for six months i'm gonna try it for a year if i don't make it uh, what you do in that six months or a year you're probably going to be a lifer, just so you know. Are you really going to go back? No. So you go, am I doing 1% better? Did I get one call back in this year instead of zero? I'm doing but better. It, it's an emotionally violent sport. Even after you have success and you're in a big movie and it bombs, or, or you're at a corporate date and you bomb. So it's just emotionally violent. It's also exhilarating. I told myself early on, I said, if David Spade ever gets on Saturday Night Live, I'll quit show business. <laughs> 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 That's how emotionally violent. I it met is. David Spade before SNL, and I wasn't on SNL. We're two civilians. Yeah, and now so, we're here today. Can yeah. you believe it? And so I legally adopted him 18 years ago because people on Instagram are, "Is he your kid, or what's going on?" He is now. Hey, son, uh, Johnny. Thank you for that, and I hope that helps.